Well, good morning. morning. Tell you this, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad for it. For this day was not promised to any of us, and we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to sit with familiar faces and unfamiliar faces, to journey with one another through this great day of worship. Uh, as has become our custom, friends, we invite you now to rise to your feet as you're comfortable, to greet two or three of your neighbors with that word of affirmation, you are a blessing from God. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you can put that in the comment section for those who are a part of our virtual congregation. It is so good to hear and to see those expressions of warmth and hospitality extended one to another. Indeed, you are a blessing from God. We thank you for blessing us with your presence this day. Those of you who are here in person, and especially those of you who are joining us virtually, you could have chosen to be uh, any number of places this Sunday morning. We appreciate that you've chosen to be with us this day. A few announcements for your hearing this day, friends. Uh, children's moment. Uh, was an oversight, so it didn't make it into the print of the bulletin, but it will uh, happen immediately after our morning musical selection, as it usually does. Uh, so that's an oversight, so uh, you'll notice that that children's moment will happen. Secondly, friends, just want to remind you that the Growth and Hospitality Ministry uh, re, uh, Revival Meeting, which <laughs> a resurgence, reconnecting, whatever that reword re is, <laughs> Uh, will be happening after service in the Markham Room. Um, we will uh, gather there about 11.45, uh, 11.50, uh, just to kind of gather with those who are interested in being a part of that uh, group of folks who are gonna look at our growth and hospitality ministries for uh, this community of faith. Uh, additionally, friends, uh, you'll see in the uh, PowerPoint announcements for this day, if you haven't already, uh, the kitchen refresh at the uh, Parsonage has been completed and it is gorgeous. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, uh, hang around after service. Those will be on the monitor during our post-worship announcements. I want to thank all those who participated in that process uh, to help refresh uh, the kitchen. It indeed looks gorgeous. We'll have a time uh, after I get back from annual conference to have an open house so that everybody can come and see the beauty of what a few cans of paint and some imagination can do. Amen. <laughs> Friends, we are grateful for all of our guests who are joining us, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are a part of our virtual community of faith. We simply want to have an opportunity to welcome you with a more extensive time of welcome. And so if you are so uh, inclined to put in the uh, comment section, you'll find in the comment section our connection card. Ask that you take a moment, complete that connection card. Again, we're not putting you on a mailing list. Simply want to offer you a more personal word of welcome. For those of you who are here in person, 
You can do that a couple of different ways. Uh, you'll find on your screen the QR code. Simply scan that with the phone, uh, the phone app, uh, the camera app on your phone. Get those things together. Camera app on your phone, not phone on your camera. Camera app on your phone. Uh, that'll bring up a digital copy of that connection card. If you want a hard copy, uh, in the back of your pews, you'll find a hard copy of that connection card. If you're filling out that hard copy, simply put that in the collection plate when it comes around during our time of offering. Again, we're not putting you on a mailing list. I simply want to send you a personal word of appreciation and welcome for you blessing us with your presence this day. The joys and concerns, friends, can be shared all the way up until the very end of the sermon. For those of you who are here uh, in person, uh, you can share those by texting that number that's on your screen. It's also on the back cover of your bulletin. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you can share those in the comment section, uh, and we'll bring those to our time of prayer later in this worship service. Uh, friends, we continue to look for a chairperson for our finance committee to organize uh, and to facilitate our meetings along with the head teller uh, to train and to schedule our tellers. If you are interested in either of those positions, uh, you simply need to email me at Pastor Anthony at FarmingtonFUMC.org, Pastor Anthony at FarmingtonFUMC.org. Uh, also, friends, unfortunately, uh, we are in the season of uh, scammers. Uh, so if you receive an email from me saying, I need you to do me a favor, but don't call me. <laughs> I need you to send me some Walmart gift cards or something to that effect. Or I am stranded over in a foreign country and lost my wallet, yada, 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 yada. Uh, the first thing you should do is call me directly. Uh, the second thing, if you have any doubts about it, look at the entirety of the email address. Most times these are Gmail addresses or some other fictional address that starts with my email address but does not end with it. Again, if you have any doubts, do not purchase any gift cards. <laughs> Call me directly uh, and we will sort that out uh, and certainly be aware of any other scams that are coming from any denominational officials. Our bishop, uh, Bishop Bard, who was just here with us in April, uh, is the subject of a scam. We're doing the very same thing of, I need your help. I'm stranded in, in Malaysia or something like that, and we know he's here. So <laughs> with that, friends, uh, be mindful of those things. Unfortunately, we are in that season. Uh, we are coming into uh, this month of Mental Health Awareness Month, and as a part of that, uh, we are having a mental health awareness seminar on May 11th uh, from 10.30 to 12.30. Uh, we're asking that if you uh, want to come and hear information about how you can be an advocate, not only uh, for yourself, but for your family members and for your community. Mental health awareness is something uh, that we certainly uh, need to be mindful of and those persons who are going around us. And mental health is not the extreme cases, it's some of the minor cases. If you're going through a season of the blues or the fogs, you just need to have some opportunity to sit and talk with someone that's gonna be helpful for us. Uh, and to that regard, friends, on the 19th, not only is it gonna be Confirmation Sunday, but we get a chance to hear and to celebrate the Reverend Michelle King, who's gonna be offering us a message in and around uh, the uh, advocacy around mental health awareness. Now we'll be celebrating her, you'll see that announcement in the slides afterward, because she's gonna be ordained as a full deacon in the United Methodist Church during our upcoming annual conference meeting. Now what does that mean? I'm glad y'all asked that question. That means that Michelle has gone through a five year process to come to this place of ordination, that she's gone through a board of examiners. I've been on that board before, and uh, they don't take it lightly. So she's gone through that process, written papers, demonstrated her call, demonstrated her ability, demonstrated her understanding, and so this is a affirmation and confirmation of her call to ministry. Now why are we doing that on Confirmation Sunday? You ask great questions. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that we're doing that on Confirmation Sunday because she was one of our confirmands. She was confirmed in this church, raised in this church. She is the daughter of this church. And so we celebrate this call on her life and this ordination that she is to receive. Uh, and we are so privileged to hear from her on the 19th. Uh, friends, also, as we move forward into next weekend, next weekend being Mother's Day. Uh, man, if you haven't figured out what your Mother's Day plan is, you got a little bit more time. <laughs> have a plan, though. Have a plan. <laughs> and don't just let it be flowers. <laughs> flowers and. Amen. Also on next Sunday, our liturgical dance ministry is restarting. And so if you are interested, all 
It's open to all, not just young ladies uh, or young men. It's open to anyone who wants to be a part of doing something beautiful and to move in faith with rhythm and praise. No prior experience is needed, just a heart that's ready to leap for joy and worship. Not necessarily physically for those who can't, but spiritually, we are looking forward to having that liturgical dance ministry restarted. Uh, so friends, we look forward to all of those announcements. You'll see those in uh, the PowerPoint after service. You'll also see those in our news and notes, weekly news and notes. And now, friends, we prepare ourselves to move forward into worship uh, with that wonderful hymn of the church. How appropriate that our last announcement is about liturgical dance, and our first hymn is Lord of the Dance. Number 261 in the hymnal, we'll sing verses 1 through 3. Number 261 in the hymnal, verses 1 through 3, as we begin this day of worship. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty and loving God, we have gathered to worship and praise your holy name. Help us embrace the challenge of spiritual, numerical, and financial growth with honesty and transparency. Reignite within us a desire to serve joyfully, give generously, pray fervently, and worship passionately. We want to be a fruitful, inspiring, and transformative community of faith. Remove all stumbling blocks that would hinder or distract us from accomplishing the mission and vision you have given to us. Bring to us the people who will have what we need to become what you envision us to be. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning is Matthew chapter 25, verses uh, 34 and 35, and chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, 
Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God.
And now I'm going to invite the children to come and join me, as we always do. God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. Amen. Come on down. So this is a really special Sunday. And I was touched by the scripture we heard this morning about um, Jesus and what he had to say about feeding those who were hungry. So one of the biggest things we do here every single year is the crop walk for church world service, that's this afternoon. And some of us are gonna walk a lot or a little, depending. And we're doing that to raise money to send to church world service for crop. And so I'd like to share with you a story about what happens um, to some of that money and an inspiration about Leslie Miguel. She's a young woman, she lives in Honduras and she was a beneficiary. She got some of the money that we're gonna raise and she started a little farm. And she started a farm and as that farm grew, she was able to feed her family with all the stuff she was growing on her farm. She fed her family because they had been very, very hungry and so then she was able to grow even more. She grew lots more. And all of a sudden, she was able to share all that she grew with people, other people who were hungry. So she had been hungry. She was given an opportunity to help feed her own family. And then she fed a whole bunch of other people. In fact, she grew so much stuff, she was able to take some to the local market and sell it. She had her garden because of what we do here to walk and raise money and awareness about hungry people all over the world. And so today, I'm going to give you this worksheet that's a dream. I want you to dream about what you might do if you had a farm. If you had a farm, what would you grow? And where would you share it? What food would you grow to help feed your own family? What food would you grow to share around the world? It's really an important thing we're doing today, not only to raise money, but to raise awareness about other people who don't have enough to eat, who are hungry. It's really hard, and Jesus was very clear that it's important to feed everyone real food. And so I'm gonna give you these and invite you to take a look if this is your imaginary farm. Would you do me a favor and pass those out? Thank you. So you're going to take a look at these, and there's an imaginary farm drawn on this piece of paper, and you get to guess about what you would draw if you were growing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, honey. If you were going to grow stuff, what would you grow? Would you grow lettuce? Would you grow potatoes? You can't grow chocolate candy. <laughs> Sorry. What would you grow? And what would you do with that? How would you use it to feed yourself and others? It's really an important thing to think about because so often, I don't know about you, I get hungry, I find a healthy bar, nut bar, or something. I, I don't have to worry about being hungry but many, many people do. And Jesus really had a lot to say about our responsibility for others in terms of making sure they had enough to eat. So 
You may take that home and work on it or think about it any way you want, okay? Just imagine what you might grow. I don't know, you like onions? <laughs> you don't, okay. You could, there's all kinds of things you can grow, healthy things. So I'm gonna invite us to pray now. Gracious God, we trust you to lead us to feed the hungry. Be with us today as we walk to share awareness and help to feed those who are hungry. In the name of Christ. Amen. You may go to Sunday school. So today, Pastor Anthony has chosen two of my most, most favorite hymns. And this is the second one. Here I am, Lord. It's number 593 in your hymnal.
Indeed, here we are, Lord. Use us as your instruments, for we, your servants, are available. Let's pray, friends. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation, where you may impart to us and speak to us, equip and encourage and inspire us to be your instruments of glory, honor, and praise that those who see us see the light of Christ shining in us. As we yield ourselves to your will and to your way, I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Today, friends, we begin a sermon series entitled, What We Value, focusing on the core values of this church. So why are core values important? I'm glad you asked the question. The uh, Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Malfries in his book, Value Driven Leadership, states it clearly this way. Core values answer the question, why do we do what we do? They are the constant, passionate, biblical core beliefs that drive ministry. Core values answer the question, why do we do what we do? They are the constant, passionate, biblical beliefs that drive our ministry. We have five core values here, friends, that help us answer that question of why do we do what we do. We believe in welcoming visitors and invitational evangelism. We believe in relevant Bible study and preaching and teaching. We believe in discipleship and we believe that people matter to God. We believe in welcoming the stranger. We believe in invitational evangelism. We believe in relevant Bible-centered preaching and teaching. We believe in discipleship, and we believe that people matter to God. We generated these five core values in 2017 after a series of meetings where we looked through a number of core values, searched and discerned what made this community of faith tick, what made us drive and motivated to reach out beyond the walls of this place to engage our community and our surrounding world. It's important, friends, to consistently remind ourselves of our core values as we seek to grow spiritually and numerically and financially. Our core values inform and influence the decisions that we make and approaches that we take for ministry. And sometimes, and most times, our core values help us answer questions and settle debates by simply saying, does this help us accomplish what we value? Our core values are reflected, friends, in our mission statement, which states that we will welcome and connect all people with God through relevant discipleship and service. To welcome, to connect, to be relevant, to disciple and to serve. Those are key words that drive us and drive our ministry. And so today, as we begin this series, friends, we begin with that first core value of welcoming strangers. We value creating an atmosphere and a culture of genuine, authentic hospitality where guests become friends and friends become community. Creating a community of authentic hospitality is not easy. And it's less about the actions that we put forth and it's more about the attitude and the desire that we have. It's about how we feel about having new people as a part of this community of faith, bringing their ideas, bringing their expertise, challenging us to get rid of some things, challenging us to tweak some things, challenging us to put aside prioritizing our personal preferences in order that we might have an expansive vision of what God wants us to do. Indeed, friends, we've all been to a place where welcome activities took place, but we truly understood we were not desired nor wanted to be there. How do I know that? I'm glad you asked that question, friends. Uh, Some of us have been into restaurants where when you walked in the door, people saw you standing at the sign that says, wait to be seated, and they kept walking past you. We've all been to a fast food restaurant when it came time to order, although nowadays you're ordering at a kiosk, but when you had a person standing behind the counter and they said, welcome to restaurant, how can I help you? We've all had that experience of having a waiter or waitress come to our table. (sighs) What can I get y'all today? We've all had the experience of having welcoming activities, but we knew that we were really not welcome. Some of us have even gone into church houses and we expected to be received and welcome and someone let us know, thank you for being here, but get out my seat. 
I tell this story because it's funny to me uh, how God has those full circle moments. Uh, when I was in college, I came home and I, I was searching and discovering. I, I wanted to move from my home church because my home church had no longer, uh, was no longer spiritually feeding me. And I said, Lord, I'm going to try some other churches in and around. And, and one of the churches that I tried that was in and around my house was a church called Scott Memorial United Methodist Church, which is the church I came from. And as I walked in, I was a nominal Methodist uh, in that I didn't sit in the very back. I sat about midway up on uh, the outside, not the inside, because some of y'all with them inside seats, y'all can cut people for them. I sit midway up on the outside, and as I was sitting there, a, a wonderful woman came up and said, uh, young man, we're glad to have you, but, but, but you're in my seat. I need you to move. And at first, I thought she was joking, and then I looked at her, and she's like, no, 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 that's my seat. I need you to move. And as I sat there, puzzled and wondering, I'm a young man coming to church. None of you know me, because I know none of you, and all of us have the same kind of desire. We want more young people in our church. We want to see more young people in our church. Do we really? Because as I sat there and I decided, you know what, it's not that big a deal. You just helped me make a cruise of the that this is not the church for me. Oh, how God has a great sense of humor. Because <laughs> two things happened at the end of that. I got up and walked right out the doors of the church and said, I'm not coming back to this place ever. And as I walked in being introduced as their pastor, God says, I'm going to give you some holy forgetfulness. Because I can't tell you who that woman was or what she even looks like. And it's good because I had to serve as their pastor for 11 years. <laughs> and that would have marked something as a differentiation of how I might have treated her as opposed to anyone else. Attitude matters when it comes to making people feel welcome. And that's the important part, friends. We can have all of the welcoming activities, have signs on the front yard. We can have people outside with balloons and boil horns. We, we can do all of that, but when they get into this place, if they're not met with the great generosity and hospitality that we really want you here, even and especially that challenges the things that I like in this place, then are we really ready to welcome others? In Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 through 40, Jesus is addressing those who have followed their shepherd, listened to the message, and applied the lessons that they have learned. Those who have understood Christ's ministry and are continuing to live according to what Christ has called them to do. They do so by providing for the hungry, the thirsty, and the naked, by extending compassion to the imprisoned and the infirm, by inviting and welcoming the stranger into the life of their community. Which brings us to point number one, friends. When we make strangers feel welcome, we are extending an invitation to them to become a part of our community and God's family. When we make strangers feel welcome, we are extending an invitation for them to become a part of our community and God's family. And doing so, we recognize it's not about me. Yes, I have my preferences, and my preferences are important, but my preferences do not take precedence over God's purpose and God's purpose for every church house and so that we make disciples of the world that we make disciples of those who are hurting, that we connect people who are wanting to be healed and redeemed, that we find every avenue to usher people into God's presence as opposed to being at the door saying, wait a minute, let me see your papers. Let me see your identification. Let me see if you're worthy to come inside. That's not our job. Christ opens the door for all of us. This day we're taking communion, and as United Methodists, we believe in what's called the open table, which means all are open to receive. All are open to come. That's what Christ leads us to. That's what Christ's great commission calls us to do, to invite people into connection with God. Making a stranger feel welcome requires us to intentionally choose to move beyond cordial pleasantries towards thoughtful engagement where we seriously ask the question, how are you doing? And we press the issue, how are you really doing? Because we're all good with our immediate knee-jerk response. How you doing? I'm good. Ask somebody again, but how are you really doing? Well, 
since you're interested, since you want to know, since this wasn't just a pleasantry exchange, since you're really interested in wanting to be a part of my life, I will tell you it's not going good. I'm struggling with some things. I'm grieving the loss of a significant partner. I'm having medical conditions that I'm wondering what's going around about. My kids are worrying me to death. I have some stuff that I certainly want someone to partner with me in prayer about so that I know I am not alone. Welcoming the stranger, engaging in someone's life beyond simply saying, when are you going to put your butt on a pew? I'm sorry, that that was a little gross. When are you going to put your behind in one of our cushion seats? Because everyone expects that from us as church people. That the ask, the motivation is, when can you be one of the number so I can feel better about a full sanctuary? But we're less likely to say, I'm more interested in what's going on with you, even if you never come to church. Welcoming the stranger. Indeed, friends, it is not the responsibility of strangers to integrate themselves into the life of any local community of faith. On the contrary, it is the responsibility of every existing member to integrate strangers into the life of that church. We've all been a stranger. We've all been the new person someplace, and we've all felt that not in our throats when we walk into a room and we don't know anybody, and we're trying to find that space, you know, that wonderful space where no one notices us. It's against the wall somewhere, maybe that chair in the corner. Maybe it's the couch sitting next to this other person who looks like they a stranger to. We all have been in that space, in that setting where we have been made to feel like strangers and we find ourselves sinking into the background until someone says, hello, my name is, what's your name? Are you new here? Well, you look like you were new here and, and you were sitting by yourself. You were by yourself. You were uh, in the distance, not thinking that you were welcome, and it's my job to make sure you feel like this is a part of your family. Which is why our attitude and desire are crucial for making others feel welcome, because it requires us to yield about me and think of others first. Welcoming strangers. When did we see you hungry and give you something to eat? When did we see you naked and give you clothes? When did we see you thirsty and provide you with something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you in? When were you in prison? When were you infirmed and we visited you? As you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. Attitude and desire matter when making others feel welcome. Every vision and mission expressed in any local church is rooted in the mission that Jesus commands of his disciples to undertake. Matthew 28 outlines that very clearly. We find Jesus offering his disciples a final word of instruction before he ascends to heaven. For Indeed, the author of Matthew offers us this great reminder that that we have and we celebrate, but do we really get down to the nitty-gritty of what it's asking us to do? Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. We are called to change the world, one family, one community, and one city at a time, which leads us to point two, friends. At the foundation of the Great Commission is Christ's expectation that we will adhere both to the spirit and the letter of the commission. At the foundation of the Great Commission is Christ's expectation that we will adhere to both the spirit and the letter of the Great Commission. That is, that we will indeed take upon ourselves to be an example of those aforementioned outcomes. That indeed, if I'm going to seek to make a disciple, I have to model what it looks like to be a disciple. If I'm going to incorporate you into the family of Christ and incorporate you into a community, I need to be a part of that community. I need to extend myself. I need to be about welcoming others, even when it hurts. And uh, friends, I know you don't believe this, but I am a natural introvert. Outside of my role here, I will sit quietly for hours and be fine by myself. But God has called me to do something different. And so while I would rather sit at the restaurant in the back table at the back corner, being able to watch everybody who comes into the restaurant, being able to order with my, what, what, what I need to have and not engage anybody, 
I'm reminded that it's not about me. That engaging others may be the opportunity that they have to hear that God loves them, that God appreciates them, that God has heard their prayer. And it's remarkable what you can do when you yield yourself to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, where you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. We sing it. It sounds great. If you ever want to hear something sound beautiful, hear 1,500 United Methodists gather to sing that song. But the importance is how much of it do we live? Are we saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Use me. I'm not going to create excuses. I'm not going to create the, but what, but um, uh, mm, uh, can't somebody else do it? I'm going to take it upon myself, Lord, to say you want to use me, so be it. And yes, that might break me outside of my comfort zone. I might have to learn some new skills. I might have to do some things that I don't want to do. But that's what Christ did for us. No one would want to voluntarily go to crucifixion. No one would voluntarily be scourged for folks who don't appreciate you. Most of us can't stand the folks who don't appreciate saying thank you when we open the door for them. Let alone folks who are willing to in one moment say hallelujah, hosanna in the highest, and then in the next few days crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Most of us, if we had to take on the mantle of Jesus, we would have said to the Lord, hellfire, come on down. These folks are lost. No hope at all. But Jesus makes it a point to make us feel welcome, to extend to us the very invitation that we needed, to remind us that, yes, you might make mistakes, but you're not the sum total of your mistakes, that you are welcome, you are invited, that you are worthy to be a part of this community. And that's what welcoming the stranger is all about. That if we truly value welcoming others and creating an environment of authentic hospitality, we must consistently do the internal work of becoming welcoming people. In order to make disciples and to baptize new souls and to teach God's commands requires us to have an environment and an atmosphere where people are welcomed. No one wants to learn something from somebody that they don't respect. No one wants to be a part of a community where people are mean-spirited. No one wants to hear anything we have to say when we live in such a way that we are inconsistent with what we're teaching. Oh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that, Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, Some of you have heard this adage that parents have used for centuries uh, that talks about being inconsistent because we are grown. Oh, you haven't heard it? Uh, It's do as I say. Oh, I thought a couple of you have heard it. Do what I'm teaching, saying to you to do, but don't model the behavior that I'm showing you. And what children do 98.9% of the time is model your behavior. When my daughter was in elementary school, before we came out here to Farmington, uh, we were at a school uh, uh, just up the road from the church, and, and one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was I was one of the, the, the parking lot dads. There were four of us in the parking lot, and in the morning, we helped kids get out the car, and in the evening, we helped kids get to their car, because uh, sometimes, not you parents, but some parents don't, don't know how to drive when they see cones and signs. Not y'all, some other folks. And one particular morning as the the cars are pulling up and I'm opening the door and I'm saying, good morning, welcome today, you're going to have a great day. I can hear this mother cursing out her son. Why was she cursing out her son? I'm glad you asked that question because I was asking myself the same question. She's cursing out her son because her son got in trouble for doing what? Cursing somebody out at school. And I'm saying to myself, what do you expect this boy to do? Your behavior, your modeling for him is this is the acceptable way to communicate with people. So if he does it in an inappropriate manner or inappropriate fashion, 
That's not the teacher's responsibility. That's not the principal's responsibility. That's your responsibility. Give him a better example. And what Christ requires of us as people of faith is that if you want to make disciples, give people an example of what a disciple looks like. If you want to make people feel welcome, give them an example of what it means to be a welcoming person. If you want to grow a community of faith, grow your own spiritual development. The formula is not hard. The execution is a beast. Because it requires me to give up stuff that I don't like to give up. To admit stuff to myself I really don't want to admit. To have Christ take the thing from me that makes me feel most comfortable. And folks, as people of faith, we can be some of the most judgmental, disrespectful, mean-spirited people around. Because we couch it all, and God knows my heart. Which leads us to point number three, friend. Each of us is a walking advertisement for Christ and our church. The question is, what kind of message are we communicating? Each of us is a walking advertisement for Christ and for our church. And the question is, what kind of message are we communicating? When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you provided for me. And the people asked the king, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you imprisoned or infirmed? Have you done it for the least of these? You've done it to me. We value welcoming strangers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the time of offering. Your continued prayerful and financial support of this community of faith is very deeply appreciated. The ushers will come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. And as the ushers receive our gifts, please sign the attendance pad that is located in the pew rack at the center aisle and pass it along to your neighbor. Guests, please place your completed connection card in the offering plate. Let us pray. Dearest Lord, with these gifts, we return to you only a small portion of the countless blessings you have bestowed upon us. With grateful hearts, we share in the work of your church and ask that you bless and multiply our offerings for the good of many. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
There we go. <laughs> Friends, we now come to the opportunity to lift one another up along with our joyous concerns before the Lord. For there's much for us to be in prayer for. Indeed, friends, we continue to lift up Rick Cole and his wife. Uh, we lift up the uh, delegates from the General Conference of the United Methodist Church who are now returning to their home churches after doing uh, some monumental work uh, and some certainly uh, denomination-altering decisions. We lift up the people of uh, Baltimore as they are nearing the completion uh, of the bridge that was, uh, did not collapse but had a collision. Uh, we lift up the people of Myanmar and the civil war that they are experiencing along with people of Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia. We lift Charles, Brian and Mandy Kempton along with Matthew and Nicholas Walter. We lift Sue Hartag and Julia Samuelson. And we lift William Brock and the family of Lolita Hall, uh, both who were entangled in a scam uh, that saw William Booth kill Lolita Hall, believing she was coming to pick up a ransom. We lift those who are in need of God's healing touch. We lift Joanne Taylor, Gail D'Amico. We lift Kelly Brown, who's preparing for surgery. We lift Susan Sackett and Glenn Morrison. We lift Dorothy uh, Coppin and the family of Dorothy Coppin as we bid farewell to her yesterday. We lift up the Reverend Carter Grimet. We lift up Aileen Adams and Mary Beth Donnelly along with James Lanza and Sam Carnell. We lift up Brenda McClendon and Sean Mullen along with uh, Pratt Bradley and John Hopek. We lift Bill Johnston and Nancy Paradise along with Larry Wisman, Jane Hopper, Paul King, Mildred Tyson, Ethel Shapiro, Monet Heath, Janice Cresswell, Karma Houston, Sue Jackson, and Dave Evans. And friends, we lift those who are battling with various forms of cancer, including Gary Johnson, Molly Jacobs. We lift Don McCourt, Diane Lynn, Judy Kruger, Michael Jackson, David Schultz, Don Gray, Matthew Jones, and Thomas Lee. As we lift those families that are in seasons of sorrow and grief, again, we lift the family of Dorothy Coffin. We lift the family of Elton Turner. We lift the family of Kathy Goltra and Sandy Carnell, along with Bob Brinson, Teresa Gettizer, the family of the Reverend Marshall Dunlap, Eleanor Wingard, Lauren and Catherine Short, and all those who are grieving, especially those who are grieving as a result of tragic means. Offer you now, friends, a moment of silent prayer for those names and situations that were lifted, along with those that are on your hearts and minds as well, a moment of silent prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to you. We attune our ears, our hearts, and our minds, our eyes to God's calling for us to make others feel welcome. Move upon us, Lord, to challenge and extend ourselves in ways that might indeed be cumbersome at first, but become natural over time, so that others might come to know you and love you as we do that others might have their lives forever changed as ours have been, that your love might permeate throughout all the spaces that we find ourselves, and that glory is brought to you. Come now, Holy Spirit, and stretch out your healing touch to those who are in need of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. Allow mind and body to unite to work that healing process. Allow those who are in care for them to have the insight and the discernment to know how to proceed with what prognosis they have been given. Speak, O oh Lord. Let your healing touch rain down upon us all, that hearts might be mended, souls might be made whole, that we might experience the freedom that comes from you. And now, Lord, use our hands and feet that we might be your hands and feet of comfort and grace to those who are grieving, for those who are challenged. Allow us to put ourselves aside to think of how you made us feel welcome and to do so with others especially those who are going through the dark valley of grief and loss. Allow us to be your presence with them when they need a shoulder to cry on, to be a presence with them when they want to laugh, to be a presence with them when they just need to sit silent. 
for we all know the sting of death and we all know too well that in times and in moments we feel all alone. Help us help others know they are not alone. Come Holy Spirit, use us as you see fit. We yield to your will and to your way, ready instruments in the hand of the great painter that the masterpiece might go forth. We pray these things in Jesus' name who offers us this model prayer as an opportunity to commune with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we prepare ourselves now to receive this great gift of wholeness and forgiveness. As I reminded you earlier, we believe in what's called an open table which means all are welcome to come and partake this day to experience the love, grace, mercy, peace, wholeness, and freedom that God offers to each and every one of us. But scripture reminds us that if we come and partake with any grievance against a brother or sister, we nullify the effects of the gifts that are being offered to us. And so friends, I offer you now a moment of silent confession that you might ask God to bring to the forefront of your mind any grievance that you might have any error that you might have with a brother or sister, that you might seek the process of forgiveness and being forgiven to extend that great gift, that your heart might be freed, that there is no resentment in you, a moment of silent confession. Hear the good news. Christ forgave us that we might forgive others. Go, knowing that you have been forgiven, that you might in turn offer that grace and gift to others. Friends, we turn our attention now to the great Thanksgiving as we move forward into this time of celebration for these gifts of wholeness and forgiveness. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right always and often to give our thanks and praise to the God who offers us hope and redemption, who reminds us that we are not the sum total of our mistakes, but that there is infinite possibility that we can still yet become what God has envisioned us to become. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hear these words of consecration, and for those of you who are joining us virtually, prepare your elements at this time. On the night in which he was to give himself over into the hands of wicked persons, he gathered disciples in the upper room, eager to celebrate God's gift of wholeness and forgiveness, God's gift of forgiveness in days gone past, but also eager to offer them a new celebration. And so as he looks into each face, he knows who would betray him, who would deny him, and who would not pick up the cross and follow. Yet he offers each and every one of us who come to this time these gifts of wholeness and forgiveness. And so he takes bread, gives thanks to the God of creation, breaks it and offers it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat all of you. This is my body which is being offered for you that you might be made whole in mind, body, and in spirit. Take, eat all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. After which he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to God, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, drink, all of you, for this is the cup of a new covenant, my sacrifice for you that you might be forgiven of all the wrong choices, all the negative language, all the negative thoughts that you've had, every opportunity that you've had to sow discord, you are now forgiven. Now go and do likewise. Take, drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus our Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, and you with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. 
Friends, as has been our custom, uh, we will begin with the all-in-one cups. If you brought an all-in-one cup, we're going to have you receive that. Uh, those who want to come and receive the one cup and one loaf, we're going to put you in the hands of our ushers at the appropriate time to line you up. We will have two serving stations as we move forward. And so, friends, we prepare ourselves to receive this day. If there's anyone who wants one of the all-in-one cups, uh, we have our wonderful ushers uh, in the back ready to give you one. If you would like one, uh, simply raise uh, the hand so that they might see you. All right, seeing none, we prepare ourselves for this day to celebrate these great gifts that God offers to each and every one of us. Light of Christ offered for us that we might be made whole. The cup of sacrifice offered for us, forgiving us our sins that we might forgive others their sins. Friends, if you have that all in one cup, if you'll peel back that clear plastic revealing that wafer. The body of Christ, take and eat. Go back that foil, take your cup, cup of sacrifice, take and drink. Those who are coming to assist with communion this day, I'm going to ask that you would come forward. come to take your cup, uh, just leave that in the garbage can as you go by.
So friends, as we prepare to depart from this place, but never from God's presence, we go forth ready to extend to others the great invitation that God has offered to each and every one of us, that their lives may be forever changed as our lives have been forever changed. Go forth knowing you are a blessing from God. Now go be a blessing to someone else. Uh, as we hear our wonderful post loop music, again, if you didn't have a chance to see all the announcements, those will be playing on the monitor. Go forth, be blessed for those of us who are uh, being a part of the crop walk. God's blessing upon us, no injuries, walk nicely and easily. If you're running, God bless you. <laughs> we prepare ourselves to dismiss this day, friends. Amen.